We begin our little tale with an introduction of the real Mandarin. Now, last time I checked, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings takes place in the MCU, and therefore it should respect its established history, right? No! 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 Mandarin sounds familiar, doesn't it? I am the Mandarin! In preparation for this movie, I rewatched Iron Man 1, Iron Man 3, and All Hail the King, knowing that the Ten Rings, the Mandarin, and Trevor Slattery would be featured. Now, despite if Shang-Chi's Mandarin is an improvement over the other one, I will not be giving it credit if it breaks continuity with what happened in those three films. So we begin with the Mandarin and his army approaching this empire. <laughs> Wow, that's pretty fucking powerful. I hope this single introductory scene doesn't fuck with the stakes of anything that's about to come. Now, how did the Mandarin obtain and master these incredibly powerful rings? Well, he... he kind of... he just kind of found them. It's not really known where and we won't get further elaboration on this. Irrelevant comic comparison time. Well, I don't read comics, but I was curious what you comic book nerds thought about the ten rings being ten bracelets that go on the user's forearms rather than actual ringies on the fingies. From the images I've seen, it looks like Trevor's Mandarin actually got this right. Do you guys feel insulted? Anyway, with this intro, we know that the Mandarin is thousands of years old. This is actually congruent with All Hail the King. You don't know the history of the Mandarin himself. He was a warrior king, inspired generations of men through the Middle Ages, perhaps even further back in time. Well done. Apparently, he's been fighting wars, taking over governments, and changing the course of history for centuries. Why does he want to take over the world? Well... <laughs> I guess. I'd like to point out, the narrator mentions he's been doing this from the shadows, and yet he sent men with visible tattoos of his terrorist organization's logo. So yeah, the Mandarin is a strategic genius. We then jump to 1996, where the narrator says, Having conquered everything he could, he came for my home. Wait, 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 hold up. Everything he could? We're in 1996, and this guy still hasn't conquered the planet? Why? He's had a couple thousand years in the resources to do so. Editor Madvocate here, whenever I say 2,000 years from here on out, I mean at least 2,000 years. The Mandarin could be 10,000 years old for all we know. I guess I was just being charitable. How far did his conquest even reach? Did it not extend outside of Asia and Europe? I mean, the narrator said the Ten Rings spread into every corner of the world, but uh... The Mandarin is alive in the present day, and the rest of the world doesn't seem to be under his control. Nor would S.H.I.E.L.D., Hydra, and the Red Room even be allowed to exist if he were in power. Unless we're gonna get another Winter Soldier twist in the sequel, revealing he had his men in each group secretly pulling the strings, and everything that's happened thus far in the MCU went according to his plan. Please, God, not another Loki situation. I mean, it didn't entirely, with the nearly world-ending events, Tony getting involved in Iron Man, and as we see in Ant-Man, he sent someone to invest in the Yellow Jacket, but couldn't because Scott intervened. Which, uh, they did this bullshit in that movie too, and for some reason they've doubled down on it in this one. And isn't that something to think about? If we were to believe this dialogue about the Mandarin having power in every corner of the world, which would include Germany, it means he just allowed Red Skull and the Nazis to rise to power. Who knows, he might have even had a hand in it. You're literally making it impossible to have any sympathy for this dude movie. Anyway, he learns of a secret mystical village named Talo, the narrator's home. He just heard of this village by picking up some random book and reading about it? How has he not read this book or heard of this village earlier? Oh, right, because Shang-Chi has to be an adult in the present MCU. The Mandarin is quite eager to conquer it, and the village is only accessible through a moving bamboo forest maze that completely opens up once a year. But that's not the only way to get through it. Sometimes, a pocket will open, but you need a fast-moving vehicle to stay in it. Guess the pocket was only useful once cars were invented. So, unbeknownst to the Mandarin and his men, the maze changes on them while driving through it, sending them off-roading. Mandarin saves himself with his rings, and then goes to the Talo entrance but by just walking there, making waiting for the maze to open pointless. 
Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. At the entrance, he meets its guardian, Ying Li. She tells him to fuck off and the Mandarin kills her. He was cruising with your top down for the July. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I thought he would have instantly killed her considering what he was capable of in the beginning. <laughs> So the Mandarin goes really easy on Ying Li instead of trying for some reason. Don't stop to watch, 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 don't stop to watch. So he's an idiot. Yeah. But like always, when two hot people fight, they start giving each other the eye. And then, whoa, 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 just like that? Did the Mandarin never mention he was a 2000 year old conqueror responsible for a plethora of death? Well, yes, he actually did because Ying Li is the one narrating this thing. Are we going to get an explanation as to why she'd fall in love with the guy who attacked her and tried breaking and entering her home after telling him to leave? Was she really never suspicious that he might have been sweet talking her to eventually let him to Talo and slaughter her people? We are talking about a man who's only strived for world domination through lethal force for 2,000 years. You know what they say, love is blind. Huh. <laughs> Wouldn't it be pretty stupid if a movie in 2021 used that as the justification for her falling in love? Ah, I'm sure this will clear things up. I mean, the Mandarin is played by THE Tony Leung. I mean, if it was any other actor, I'd have to ask the director and like, do some backstory, like, research, imagination. But with Tony, it's just like, it's almost like it's impossible to not fall in love with him, right? He's so charismatic, so charming. Even when he's angry, you're like, woo, you're so handsome. So I feel like it's almost like very natural. Ah, the power of horny strikes again. Thank you for excusing the lack of romantic development between two starkly different characters by saying the actor is just handsome and charming so it was meant to be. Thank you for admitting you would have preferred more substance had it been an uglier actor. And what about him? How is he even capable of loving at this point? 2,000 years of dictatorship and massacre, and he decided decides to give that up on a dime because... woman. And who's that? Oh, it's Mr. MVP! Simp! The Mandarin didn't give it up because he saw a woman, Madvocate. He later says he thought being a warlord was all he was meant to be. But Ying Li showed him a part of himself he didn't know was there. And it was like he was seeing the world for the first time. Okay. So what does that mean? The visuals accompanying the narration don't help at all. What part of himself did she discover for him that he couldn't discover on his own or from someone else previously? That love and families are a thing? That he doesn't have to take over the world? Why did he think that was all he was meant to be to begin with? Did childhood trauma completely affect his worldview? Was he manipulated by a close one into abusing his power? Society? Well, no. At the very beginning, Ying Li says he could have used his rings for good, but but all he wanted was power. And I'm not saying it's impossible for him to love and completely change course, but because he's established as being evil for two millennia completely of his own volition, and from the lack of on-screen development, I'm calling this one character assassination. Though there are people who somehow think this change was completely earned. And the relationship between Wenwu and Lee is also completely believable. Playing Dance Dance Revolution as a family suggests that mom and dad were happy together, but we see some genuine chemistry between Wenwu and Lee. <laughs> to be clear, Nando might believe the actors have genuine chemistry, which is all good, but didn't stop to think if this entanglement even makes sense with who the characters are and what their place in the world is. We then jump to the present day, where Shang-Chi, aka Sean, is a big boy in San Francisco working a job as a valet attendant. He has a plucky side character co-worker and friend of 10 years named Katie. How do I know they've been friends for a decade? You may not have caught it, but it's really subtle and not contrived. Sean, we've been friends for 10 years. Okay, you know I'm not an idiot. 
A few moments later. I knew Katie was trouble the first day we met in high school. A few moments later. I've been by your side for half your life. Why have the painfully shoehorn 10 years line if you're going to then give us an idea of when these two met? We later learn that Shang-Chi picked his American name at 15, so that narrows it down even more. Of all the things they could have been worried about explaining, this was one of them? Does Disney seriously not trust their audience to do the quick maths? And right before he's about to throw the first punch, Katie comes out of nowhere, steps right between us, and starts screaming the lyrics to Hotel California. What? <laughs> it's the art of confusion. Works great on stupid people. This line here is meant to be a setup for a payoff later. However, it is important to note the context of the story Katie is telling. She saved Shang-Chi from a beating by yelling something random at a bully. In high school. Presumably a dumb teenage bully. That is all. Keep this in mind for later. The next morning, Sean and Katie hitch a bus when some dude confronts Sean, telling him to give up his pendant. A fight breaks out where Sean bursts into a kung fu frenzy. Yo, what up y'all? It's your boy Clev, coming at you live on the bus. In this shot, Clev's live stream begins with 43 viewers, with comments and likes already flooding in. And it shoots up to 1.3k viewers in 6 seconds. Clev? should not be taking the bus with these numbers. He should be driving a Lamborghini with sponsorship and ad money. Oh well, it's not like this live stream will have any effect on future plot, right? 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 Quick nitpick, because it's hilarious that they fucked up the timing on this. But his phone says he started streaming one minute and five seconds ago, even though he just said, Yo, what up y'all, it's your boy Clem. And the fight only started 20 seconds ago. Seems like an easy fix for the editing room, but honestly, what can you expect from the studio that can't even get tic-tac-toe right? Okay, this is a little too bullshit for my suspension of disbelief. Like, this thing isn't even nanotech, but somehow a long-ass blade with a flaming edge can retract and be powered in such a confined amount of space. But whatever, guess the Ten Rings are just that technologically advanced. Oh, how do I know these men are from the Ten Rings, you ask? Well, the Mandarin decided to dress this guy in Ten Rings merch, logo fully exposed, when he's allegedly trying to commit a murder from the shadows. Man, it's been quite a while. I wonder what the Ten Rings have been up to all these years. I'm guessing when they weren't crippling governments, they were streaming movies and shows exclusive to the countries they're in. You can do this too, without having to travel the world, by using Surfshark VPN, the sponsor of this video. With Surfshark, you can access region blocked content so you have even more movies and shows to pick from on the streaming services you already use. Like maybe after watching Shang-Chi, you're in the mood for some sick Wing Chun Ip Man action on Netflix. But aw oh man, they don't have Ip Man in your country. That's when you turn to Surfshark, just pick a location for a new IP address, refresh the page, confuse your browser, and now you have access to media you previously didn't. Not only does Surfshark change your IP address and hides your location, it also encrypts your online Online activity so your data is kept private. This is most helpful when using a public Wi-Fi, cause there are shady people out there who be snooping. Huh. Maybe Shang-Chi doesn't use a VPN at coffee shops and that's how the Ten Rings were able to track him. And the beauty of it all? You can use Surfshark on an UNLIMITED amount of devices at a time for 83% off for one year plus three months free by going to surfshark.deals slash madvocate or entering coupon code madvocate. And if it's not for you, there's a 30 day money back guarantee. That's surfshark.deals slash madvocate for 83% off a one year plan plus three months free. Thanks Surfshark for sponsoring the video. Come on, bro! And now you're probably wondering, why hasn't the bus driver stopped and demanded these lunatics get off his bus or call the cops? Well, you see, he had his earbuds in, listening to music, loud enough to not hear all the commotion in the back, and loud enough to prevent him from looking at his rearview mirror and seeing the fight. Now, if you haven't kept track, the bus has been driving for 2 minutes and 15 seconds before the brakes are accidentally cut, and in these 2 minutes and 15 seconds, 
nobody's gotten the driver's attention, nobody's pulling the signal cord, everyone sits around doing nothing because I guess it's just your typical Tuesday in San Francisco, no red lights or stop signs were encountered, and nobody's needed to get off or on at any of the stops the bus has already passed. As soon as the brakes are cut, the bus driver just so happens to need them to stop at his first red light. Contrived? Yeah, I'd fucking say so. Sorry. Whoop, did you see that? Blade Arm doesn't even touch Shang-Chi even though it sliced right through the laptop. Yup, he's dead. And if it wasn't even going to touch Shang-Chi to begin with, it means he just destroyed this poor woman's laptop for no reason. Well, when we consider she reacted to this with all the concern of a plastered rodent, it's really her fault her property was destroyed. Shang-Chi actually shows some concern for innocent human lives, so that's a step in the right direction after this embarrassment. <laughs> And you and your sister deserve what's coming. Ooh, scary. Keep this threat in mind, it will become relevant later. After an inane amount of collateral damage and possibly death, it turns out Blade Arm Man successfully snagged Shang-Chi's pendant, and his immediate response is to fly to Macau to protect his sister. Those guys are going after my sister next, I have to get to her first. My sister sent me this a few months ago. I think it's the address of where she's staying. If they hurt her, I'm sorry, but I have to go. Fine. You can explain on the plane. What? No, Katie, you can't- You can explain on the plane, Sean! Why is Katie going with him? I don't know, you'd think Shang-Chi would do everything in his power to prevent this, considering another deathmatch like the one on the bus is likely waiting for him in Macau, so Katie's blood is on his hands if she dies. She might even just slow him down if she needs saving, since, you know, she has zero combat experience. Oh, that's exactly what happens. It wouldn't even be hard to stop her, Katie just leaves, so all he has to do is not tell her what flight he's taking or where he's going exactly. So they're both going on this spontaneous trip to another country with no telling of when they'll be back. And I guess these valet attendants have the money for immediate plane tickets. We're already prepared with everything required for international travel, and expect their jobs to welcome them back with open arms whenever they return. <laughs> After my mom died, my dad started my training. From sun up to sundown, I was taught every possible way to kill a man. By the time I was 14, I could barely remember what life was like before she died. Oh, so you're giving Shang-Chi the fin treatment like you did with Yelena? Shut up. The point is, I've never, I've never had control over my own life before, and now I do. God, I knew it. I knew you did. It's so cool, right? It's cool. Yes. And you can put so much stuff in there. You wouldn't even know. This would be a cool way to die. I don't get my period, dipshit. I don't have a uterus. That's what happens when the red room gives you an involuntary hysterectomy. They kind of just go in and they rip out all of your reproductive organs they just get right in there and they chop them all away everything okay, out okay okay so you can't okay babies. you don't have to get so clinical and nasty oh well i was about to talk about fallopian tubes but okay You'd think giving a child this inhumane kind of training to commit the most inhumane act every moment he's awake until he's 14 would be detrimental to his psyche for the rest of his life. But nah, he's a fun-loving, socially adept, well-adjusted dork. If he asked me to burn the world down, I would have asked him- Be for vegetarian. Ah, looks like we were getting a little too serious for Disney. Not only is this shit an absolute tone killer, but the writer thought it would be an excellent idea to double down on it and milk it as much as they could. So, oh, we're out of the vegetarian too. Now we only have beef. Beef, because that's all you have, right? Okay, you'll have the beef. Yes, and, beef. and the beef. Two beefs. I should also probably mention that my name's not technically Sean. It's Shang-Chi. Shang? You change your name from Shang to Sean? 
I wonder how your father found okay, you. I was 15 years old, all right? Hi, my name's Gina. I'm gonna go into hiding. My new name's Gina. Fuck off with the lampshading movie. I mean, for fuck's sake, this dude spent years practicing how to kill people in every possible way. I doubt he's supposed to be this incompetent when it comes to strategy. Actually, considering he's the Mandarin's son and was trained by him, he probably is. We all know the strategic genius that guy is. At Macau, Shang-Chi and Katie find the location of his sister in the Golden Daggers Club, which is an underground fighting ring in a skyscraper full of wacky, zany characters. On the elevator ride up, some shady dude tells Shang-Chi to sign his iPad to enter. He doesn't ask Katie to sign in though, and Shang-Chi isn't suspicious of this at all. Also, what kind of sign-in sheet requires this much reading? with steps. Shang-Chi signs a contract without looking at it on the way up, but if you took even one proper glance, it's very clear that they are about to go into an underground fight ring. It even says the company takes no responsibility for any physical injuries or death by superpowers or aliens. They are then greeted by some dude who immediately recognizes him as Bus Boy. Apparently the bus fight streamed by Clev already got 2 million views, and this guy just had the video on standby. Whatever. The greeter tells them the fights are streamed to the dark web. And Shang-Chi is up next, in the big cage. And in the big cage is Wong and Abomination. Yes, the same Abomination from The Incredible Hulk. Well, not quite actually, cause now <laughs> he has fins on the side of his head. Wong opens a portal to counter his punch, and I am once again forced to imagine the missed opportunities of using this on Thanos in Infinity War to cut his arm off. After knocking him out, Wong takes Abomination back to what looks like a cell. Now, if you haven't turned off Brain, you might be wondering, Huh? The hell just happened? Why are Wong and Abomination associates? How did they even meet each other if Abomination's been incarcerated for over a decade and a half? You're telling me Wong just decided one day to pay him a visit in his cell? Why the hell does Wong think it's a good idea to illegally bring what is essentially evil Hulk to a public space for fucking cage fights? Are there really no cameras in his cell that would catch this and inevitably make Wong a criminal? It is of no concern. Fuck you, Wong. You were the only character I was rooting for in No Way Home. After the trailer told us the entire plot happens because Doctor Strange is a goddamn out of character moron. You're gonna do this shit and then tell Strange not to cast a spell because it's too dangerous. It's ironic. Just leave me out of this. After witnessing Wong's assassination, Shang-Chi naturally tells the greeter that a cage fight isn't what he's here for, and the greeter says he has to because the thing he signed was actually a fighting contract. Uh, isn't this supposed to be an underground fighting ring? Who would they even report a breach of contract to? So, Shang-Chi could easily refuse the fight, knowing there likely won't be repercussions. Also, remember how he immediately dropped everything back home and booked a same or next day international flight? What was that for again? Oh, right, because the sister might be in a life or death situation. So, what does Shang-Chi do? Bus <laughs> And turns out, the person he's fighting is... Drumroll, please. <laughs> His fucking sister. And the greeter introduces her by her real name. I'm not here to fight anybody. Okay, I'm looking for my sister, Su Never heard of her. So, the greeter lied to Shang-Chi, even though he would have absolutely no reason to, since Zhe Ling's name is used out loud in here. And for years, Zhe Ling has just been using her real name in an underground fighting ring while she's likely being searched for by her father. <laughs>
It would have made complete sense for her to have used an alias. The greeter wouldn't recognize her real name when asked, therefore he wouldn't have lied for no reason, and she's supposed to be hiding from the Mandarin. I guess she's dumber than Shang-Chi, at least he Americanized his name. Anyway, now you might be wondering, wait, I thought the Mandarin prohibited yelling from training with the boys, how did she get so amazing at fighting? I'll have to jump ahead, but well... I wasn't allowed to train with the boys. But I watched everything they did, and taught myself to do it better. Somehow, simply watching translated to actual hands-on practice with experts in the field. Not how this works. Getting a little deja vu from WandaVision. These are runes, Wanda. Only the witch that casts the runes can use her magic. A few moments later. You know what he said to me when he left? I'll be back in three days. Three days turning to a week. A week turned to a month, and a month turned to six years. So, this is interesting, because Shang-Chi dropping everything and instantly flying here tells me he deeply cares for his sister. And yet, he never came back for her. Instead, he went to California to start a new life. Nor did he go visit her right after he got that postcard months ago. Even though he straight up says he assumed this address is where she's staying. Getting a little deja vu from Black Widow. Where did you think I was all this time? I thought that you got out and were living a normal life. And perhaps there is a reason for him going to another country and never returning, but that doesn't mean he couldn't help his sister anymore. There is no indication he went to the authorities or tried contacting S.H.I.E.L.D. or Tony Stark to ask them to look into the Mandarin and his location with their advanced technology. His compound is on the side of a mountain fully exposed. I'm sure this would get picked up by satellites. If Shang-Chi could get in touch, I imagine telling them he's related to the guy running the Ten Rings base of operations would spark their interest just a little bit. He could have killed three birds with one stone, save his sister, fuck over his dad, and topple the ten rings. He had ten years to make an attempt, but he did nothing as proven by his complete silence. Not looking great for his characterization. I can't tell if he really cares about his sister or doesn't give a shit at all. What's also interesting is, how did Shang-Chi even get to America? The reason he was able to leave was because his dad sent him on a solo mission to kill the leader of the Iron Gang, the one responsible for Ying Li's death. But it can be inferred that the Iron Gang also resides in China. A whole bunch of them just show up to Wenwu's compound one night in a flashback, and Wenwu pays some of them a visit in a bar soon after. So Shang-Chi wasn't taken out of the country to deal with them. And he couldn't have hitched a plane because it's not like he has money, a passport, a visa, or even an ID. You might say, well, he traveled to the Iron Gang in a helicopter with a pilot, so there you go. But A, the pilot Pilot wouldn't just agree to help Shang-Chi fly away from his dad, and B, even if Shang-Chi knocked out the pilot and took the chopper for himself, he doesn't know how to fly it. Traveling across continents and an ocean with no resources isn't just something you can say just happened. You could honestly have an entire movie just about how Shang-Chi escaped, but we don't even get a throwaway line. Anyway, Shang-Chi then confronts Jialing about the postcard she supposedly sent him, and get this. The postcard, which had no name and no message, supposedly sent by someone who would have no fucking way of knowing where he lives, wasn't actually sent by her. Who would have guessed? And oh my god, if it ain't the biggest coincidence of all time. Katie, we're out of options, we have to go now. I'll buy you some time, just keep going. On a dark desert highway, cool wind in my hair. Remember when she said doing this confuses stupid people? This, 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 this was the payoff. It works on a deadly assassin trained by a 2,000 year old conqueror. No, Katie is dead. Wait, why are they using stun batons and not guns? Good question! Please, piss off if you're going to tell me they don't because the Mandarin wants to stick to traditional weapons or his culture. That would be like defending the Wakandans using trial by combat to elect their king. This dude was literally buying Stark weaponry in 2008, which were purely explosives and firearms. He was also about to buy the Yellow Jacket in 2015, meaning he was very interested in more efficient methods of killing. But nope, I'll downgrade my men to use electric sticks and piss 
off twice if you're going to tell me his army doesn't use guns because he doesn't want to draw attention. Hey, what? Whoa. Get off of me! Come on, bro! <laughs> <laughs> Strategic Warlord, everyone. Who the fuck approved this bullshit? Yelling somehow knew Katie was about to fall. Which floor to be on, and which room to be in, and had the super speed to make it there on time. No, Katie is dead. Again. No, they're both dead. I do not believe for one second Yelling is capable of catching Katie the way she did, with her legs while barely holding onto the scaffolding after Katie's fallen several stories. The force would have been far too great, and look, the bamboo is too girthy for hands to fully wrap around for a strong grip. Katie would have taken Yelling with her to the street. <laughs> And before I get called a misogynist, let me phrase that differently. I do not believe a regular human is capable of catching Katie the way it was done. <sighs> okay, first of all, Shang-Chi didn't leave you for dead. He may have left you with a neglectful and shitty father, but that doesn't mean you were constantly at risk of being killed. Second, you had no idea if he would survive this onslaught. You can't tell him you were trying to make a point if he's fucking dead. She was so determined to make this point, she was even chill leaving his friend, who had nothing to do with his decisions, to die. <laughs> What does he want with the pendant? Did America make you soft? No, what the fuck? He wasn't sparing him, he was trying to get information. Shang-Chi literally kills someone a few seconds before this to save you. Great work, I can't tell if this was supposed to be a girl boss moment or subtle commentary on western culture or nothing at all. Either way, this just made Jialing look stupid. Again. <laughs> I told my men they wouldn't be able to kill you if they tried. Glad I was right. Glad you were right? What What the fuck is going on? What? Why the fuck would you take that risk? You only need the pendants, you fucking idiot! Let's go home. Okay, let's go over the Mandarin's goals and his plan thus far. He wants both pendants. He also wants to bring his children back home, so that kind of means he needs them alive. He knows where both of them live. And of course, he wants to remain hidden from the world, which would best be achieved by not making a scene in public. So, his plan was to send his son a postcard with nothing but an address and a drawing, in hopes he will think it means it was sent by his sister who somehow knows where he lives. He's also hoping his son wouldn't go to said address to see his sister within the months before he sends his men there. He's also also hoping both of them still even have their pendants and regularly wear them. Months later, he will send a group of his men sporting his terrorist logo to take the pendant from him, one of them having a fucking sword for an arm. His men are to confront him on a bus in public and if he refuses, they should try to kill him over it. The Mandarin is confident that his son, who's been gone for a decade, has continued martial arts training during this time so that he's at peak performance for this fight, and won't get killed. After they have Shang-Chi's pendant, the same group of men plus a bunch of ninjas are to go to Macau for Xiaoling's pendant. The Mandarin is confident that his son will show up at the same time his men do, and when he does, they should try to kill him and his friend despite already having his pendant. And this time, they'll use explosives and knives. Then, after this fight's gone on for a while and the friend died multiple times, he reveals himself and expects Shang-Chi and Jialing to be cool with all of this and come with him back to the compound. <laughs> Ha 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 ha!
What was the point of the postcard if all you did was have Shang-Chi intervene and possibly sabotage your mission of getting Zhe Ling's pendant? Why didn't you send two separate groups of men to attack your children at the same time? Why didn't you have them attack in a private place like their homes instead of out in fucking public? If you wanted to bring them home with you, then what exactly were you going to do if Shang-Chi didn't or couldn't go to Macau after his pendant was stolen? Or more likely, what if Shang-Chi didn't know you were going after his sister because this guy didn't end up saying, You and your sister deserve what's coming. What? Were you going to have your men travel from California to Macau, pick up Zhe Ling, and then travel back to California to pick up Shang-Chi? <laughs> You know what actually would have happened? Shang-Chi would have either given up the pendant or gotten his ass kicked because he's been actively repressing his previous life as a martial arts assassin for the past 10 years. He's in absolutely no condition to take on the henchmen. And no, doing push-ups before you go to work does not equal rigorous hand-to-hand -hand combat training. Let's talk more about this dumbass line. You and your sister deserve what's coming. I've already covered that this line is the only reason why Shang-Chi knows to go save his sister, but it makes no fucking sense with what the Mandarin's goals are. He allegedly doesn't want to kill his children, and he has no grudge against them. So what the hell did he tell Blade Arm Man to make him this fucking pissed and tell Shang-Chi he and his sister deserve what's coming? That's a straight up threat of revenge. Blade Arm Man should have been confused as fuck when he saw the Mandarin welcome his children with open arms. I told my man they wouldn't be able to kill you if they tried. Uh, no, apparently you didn't. You and your sister deserve what's coming. Fuck this plan, and fuck this villain. At least he can't get any worse than this, right? Let's go home. Funny story. Some years ago, a terrorist from America needed a boogie man to bring your country to his knees. He appropriated the ten rings. My ten rings. But because he didn't know my actual name, he invented a new one. The Mandarin. He gave his figurehead the name of a chicken dish. America was terrified of an orange. Oh, so you're not the Mandarin. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Shang-Chi has now retconned the retcon of the subversion. The Mandarin? See, it's not real. I am the Mandarin! I'm not the one that's going to kill you, Mr. Slattery. There's somebody who wants to meet you. Do I know him? No. But you took his name, and now he wants it back. He gave his figurehead the name of a chicken dish. America was terrified of an orange. <laughs> My real name is Wenbu. So why did you send a team and a fake interviewer to break Trevor out to kill him yourself if the Mandarin is so irrelevant to you? You think it's pathetic America fell for such a silly character for crying out loud. Why even go after Trevor, some lunatic actor, when the details of the fake terrorist were publicly exposed, with Killian and the vice president behind all of it? Who the fuck knows, we'll just chalk it up to arrogance I guess, since that's the excuse every stan uses to explain characters inconsistent and idiotic decisions these days. The truth is, I've had many names throughout my life. The Warrior King, Master Khan. Okay, general rule of thumb. If you're going to give an alias to your villain you want the audience to sympathize with, don't give them a name like Master Khan. For the longest time, my friends and I thought Master Khan was referring to Genghis Khan. It wasn't until recently that I googled Master Khan and found out he's a fictional character from the comics. Do you know why we instantly believed Wenwu was the Genghis Khan of the MCU? Because they're pretty much the same person, and Wenwu 
Nobu was alive during the reign of Genghis Khan. Only Genghis Khan was much worse for being a serial rapiste with several wives and concubines. It was also hard to believe that for two millennia, the power-hungry psychopath remained celibate, so we didn't even bat an eye when we thought the movie was confirming his dick ran rampant spawning children left and right. This family is portrayed as being special to Wenwu and the only one he's ever had, but because you wanted to make this obscure comic reference, you just risk destroying that notion with this name, especially as it lines up with Wenwu's history. Good job! She gave up everything so we could be together. Why? But I always have free choice. So Wen Wu tells everyone how after Shang-Chi and Jialing ran away, he started researching how to get through the maze to the Talo entrance to connect with Ying Li. Um, literally a minute ago, during the dinner scene, there were flashbacks of him successfully going to the Talo entrance multiple times to go on dates with Ying Li. I say again, Wen Wu has been desperately trying to find the path to Talo for years when he's fucking walked there multiple times with no problem in the past. Okay, 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 okay. Let's just accept this galaxy brain logic for a second. Let's just pretend it completely makes sense. So Wen Wu can't just walk to the Talo entrance. Okay, alright. Why not use his fucking helicopter to fly to the entrance? It is of no concern. I mean, knowing the psychopath he is, I'm surprised he didn't just send his army to cut down the forest and make his own path. Or fuck the army, he could easily mow it down himself. Uh, Madvocate, it's a fucking magical moving forest. The bamboo is probably extra strong and immune to the Ten Ring. <laughs> Sorry, had to jump ahead to shut down any comments about to tell me I'm wrong for assuming that. Anyway, until recently, Wenwu started hearing his wife's voice telling him she's trapped behind a gate there, held prisoner by the villagers she grew up with. Wenwu 100% believes this, and even mentions Ying Li is leaving behind clues. Now, I need to jump ahead to a flashback we're shown for a second. Wenwu saw Ying Li's dead bloodied corpse with his own fucking eyes. He probably buried her her himself. Nobody check the body at the grave. Now, let's rewind and pretend for a moment that Wen Wu's men successfully killed Shang-Chi and or Zheling. Let's also pretend this voice talking to Wen Wu is believable and real and he successfully frees Ying Li so they can live happily ever after. How the fuck does he think she's going to react when she finds out one or both of her children were killed by men sent by him? Or that he raised her son to be a killing machine? Yeah, there goes your happily ever after, you fucking idiot. Oh, my bad. She probably wouldn't care if he killed her children. You see, but I Come to think of it, Wenwu doesn't only want Ying Li, he believes her return will unite their whole family and things will go back to the way they used to be. How the fuck are you going to achieve that if one or both of your kids are dead? And it only gets worse. Wenwu says the Talo elders forbade him and Ying Li from living in Talo together because he wasn't worthy to them. And for that, he blames them for the death of Ying Li. Now, I need to jump ahead again again, to the same flashback I brought up before. Since they can't live in Talo, they obviously lived in Wenwu's compound. And one night, the Iron Gang just walks into the compound and kills Ying Li. Where the fuck was Wenwu's security? It is of no concern. If Wenwu's out for groceries at fucking 10pm, you'd think he'd have at least a few guards by the front door to protect the only people he's ever loved, especially when he knows he's made enemies. Or, you know, he could've just fucked Fucking locked it. Yeah, her death is 120% your fault, you absolute dipshit. Is it safe to say now that it's very possible the Mandarin from Iron Man 3 is better than the supposedly real Mandarin? No! The timing of the Iron Gang's arrival is so strange as well. Wen Wu ended his reign in 96 when he met Ying Li, and Shang-Chi and Jialing are little kids when they storm in, so they decided to be mad at Wen Wu and barge in years after he went dormant. <laughs> Shang-Chi tells him there's no voice, their mom is dead, and she isn't leaving behind clues. And Wenwu responds... Then what are these? Oh, those? Those are just pendants Ying Li gave her children when they were little, to help them feel safe when they're lost. 
Did, did you not know they were made God knows how many years before Ying Li died? Well, obviously he did, because the entire first act was about obtaining them from his kids who he hasn't seen in 10 years. So what the fuck is this assumption? He's acting as if the pendants just showed up on his doorstep one day, or materialized out of thin air in front of him. So the two pendants are used to activate this water simulation of the maze upon placing them in the eyes of this dragon mural that was never established. How is this physics-defying mural that creates a map to a place Wen Wu's unfamiliar with even in his compound to begin with? I, I, I don't, I, 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 It is of no concern. Since Shang-Chi and Jialing don't buy Wen Wu's story and refuse to help him because why the fuck would they, he imprisons them. Either Wen Wu only has one damn cell for prisoners and no way to chain them up, or his guards were too arrogant to put them in their own individual cells and chain them up. I have a hard time believing both. Someone getting the dankest head in the world is heard in the distance. <laughs> And when they approach the individual, it is revealed to be Trevor fucking Slattery. He's... alive? I'm not the one that's going to kill you, Mr. Slattery. Then my dad broke you out. To kill you. But just as his men were tying me up for my execution, I launched into a performance of my Macbeth. Whence is that knocking weight Duncan with thy knocking? I wish thou could. They couldn't get enough of it. I've been doing weekly gigs for lads ever since. <sighs> I am so tired. Remind me, why was Wenwu going to execute him? But you took his name, and now he wants it back. He gave his figurehead the name of a chicken dish. Right. So, not only did the guards put them all in the same cell and gave them free reign to walk around, but a cell that was already occupied. Eh, it's okay. It's not like locking them up with Trevor is going to reveal very important information that'll advance the plot for them in any way. Anyway, Trevor reveals very important information that'll advance the plot for them, thanks to this mythical creature named Morris that was picked up by Wenwu during one of his expeditions to find the entrance to Talo. Morris grew up with Ying Li and knows how to get through the pocket in the forest. I'm putting a pin in discussing the issues with Morris's very existence in this story once more information is revealed. Why is Morris, a native Taloian, and potentially helpful for getting to Talo, which he is, incarcerated? It is of no concern. Apparently, a lunatic British hobo learned to understand Morris's language somehow, so you think it'd be easier for Wenwu to learn it. While Shang-Chi and Katie are learning about Trevor and Morris, Jialing goes off somewhere and kicks down a stone wall. Wenwu locked up his martial arts experienced children in a prison whose walls can just be kicked down. And Jialing says there are underground tunnels that can take them to the garage because that's how she escaped last time. And in the garage, they steal a car and are spotted by security cameras. <clears throat> so Wenwu has cameras in the garage, but not in the prison or around his front door. I'm not gonna pull a clev and bother breaking down this fight, because what happens next is a whole bunch of stupid. Shang-Chi manages to bring a goon in the car and knock him out, because to open the garage door, you need the fingerprints of a goon to open it and a thumbprint to close it. It's extremely convenient that the garage door opens and closes on a dime, because it allows them to not crash into it and causes the goons to crash into it. Fuck you, Madvocate. It was probably designed to instantly open and close in case of intruders. Wenwu is a strategic genius. Once again, you are highlighting how Wenwu takes great security precautions with his fucking garage, but not for his prison or his front door. Wenwu is then watching them drive away and says, They will come back once I bring her home. Oh, this is his reasoning for not immediately going after them. Three days from now, we will rescue my wife from her prison and bring her home! They'll be driving for three days before Wenwu tries to free Ying Li, and assuming Wenwu assumes they're driving away as far away from him as possible, since he doesn't know they have a creature that knows how to get through the maze and its location, how the fuck will they know once Ying Li is back? From a feeling? How do you know? A feeling. 
so he should probably go get them in case they never return or get stranded in the middle of nowhere from gas or battery depletion. Or don't, because capturing them now would fuck up the plot, you know. Wait, what? He has cameras in several barren hallways and rooms. One's on a stairwell. One's just a truck. Are, th are these bathroom stalls? Are these cameras watching the public in some faraway city? Are these random stock videos of the world? Motherfucker, you have all these cameras set up, but not a single one in your prison or your front door? <laughs> the next day, while they're waiting for the pocket to open, Trevor tells everyone about what got him to start acting. Oh, I know this story. He told us a little in All Hail the King. He had a photo of him and his mom on October 12, 1964, the day he landed his first role, meaning he's likely been going to auditions before that. Shang-Chi can't possibly fuck up this extremely simple piece of history, right? 1968, Planet of the Apes. I was sitting in the cinema next to my mom, watching Mastery. After the film, I asked her, how did they get those monkeys to do those things? And she patted me on the head and she said, it's not real pet. It's just acting. That's when I knew. Kowalski, analysis. Enhance. Feige, all you had to do was tell the fucking intern to watch Iron Man 3 and All Hail the King and write down what's been established. Fear not, for I am certain there is an extremely good reason for them kinda forgetting this. So you became an actor because you thought the monkeys were actually- Riding horses? I did. Yes. When in fact, they were simply acting as if they were riding horses. I still can't get my head around it, to be honest. The funny. It was for the funny. Anything for the funny. Morris tells him to go since the pocket is ready to open. How does he even know how to get through the maze if he'd have no reason to use it? I am but a transitory vessel for the infinite wisdom of a creature far more advanced than we will ever truly understand. Okay, I guess he knows everything or can predict the future. Either way, fuck off. He's the world's furriest and shittiest plot device. Once they're inside, Shang-Chi wastes time introducing everyone to the villagers instead of immediately telling them when Wu was preparing to wage war on them. If it wasn't for his aunt joining, they would have been forced out. Our people have been here for over 4,000 years, preparing for something we hope will never happen. We are the keepers of the Dark Gate, sworn to protect this realm and yours from the evil that's locked behind it. The Dweller in Darkness. He came with his army, devouring every soul in their path. And with each kill, they grew stronger. Your father isn't the first to come here to open the Dark Gate. Many have tried and failed over the centuries, and they all had one thing in common. They were lured here by the voice of something on the other side. A voice that promised them their greatest desires. This has been their purpose for over 4,000 years. Not only was this information absent from the scriptures about Talu Wenwu read in the beginning, but Ying Li never told Wenwu that since 4,000 years ago, her village's entire purpose is to contain a soul-eating dragon behind a gate, and that many people over the centuries have tried opening it because they were lured by a voice promising them their greatest desire. Because if she had told him this, Wenwu wouldn't be this much of a dumbass, and this entire movie wouldn't have happened. Again, they managed to fall in love, date, get married, and have a family without once bringing up what Ying Li did for a living. Fuck. Off. Now, not to nitpick, not unlike my podcast mostly nitpicking, Okay. you kind of oh, figure wow. at some point in their at least eight year relationship, Lee would have told Wenwu yeah, that's not a nitpick. the evil monster trapped in her dimension that promises you whatever you want. That's, 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 that's not a nitpick. That's not a nitpick. That breaks the entire fuck? film. Literally nothing would happen as it does if she had to Hey, you know what's interesting about my village? We have a monster tied up that lies to you. But maybe Wenwu is just a bad listener. I don't know. <laughs> We're really gonna argue when we who's in a very happy marriage just does a list to his wife and that's something so important. I completely missed this the first time I watched it. I didn't I don't I don't remember this at all, but he's saying it is a nitpick and then he goes on to explaining why it's not a nitpick. <laughs>
I, I can't. <laughs> Wait, why the fuck is there literature about Talo on Earth if it's been a secret this whole time and the villagers want to keep it that way? It is of no concern. If someone previously found it and then wrote about it, then how did they even make it to the entrance without knowing the maze? And if you're going to tell me they just walked to it, then why the fuck doesn't Wenwu just walk to it? Remember how I said I'd come back to discuss Morris? Well, it's time to go on that tangent. Morris being picked up during one of Wenwu's expeditions to find the entrance to Talo means he wasn't inside Talo and presumably far away from the entrance. He probably wandered off and fell through the portal to Earth. That's whatever, I guess. But this means Ying Li was never replaced as the guardian of the entrance after she left. And as we just saw, there still isn't a new guardian. But if there was a guardian, then Morris would have never been part of this story. The new guardian would have stopped him since they want Talo to remain hidden, and having a creature like this roaming around Earth would only raise many questions. So yeah, that's what I wanted to point out. The way Morris is included in this story is kinda shoddy. She knew that one day you would find your way here, and asked me to prepare something for your arrival. Remind me, how did Ying Li die again? Oh yeah, randomly. So why does this line sound like she knew she was gonna die in advance as if she had some terminal illness? How was she supposed to warn her sister to prepare these outfits? You're telling me she was never gonna bring her children to Talo herself someday? She was expecting them to go on their own after she died? How are they supposed to get there if she never told him where the forest was or that the purpose of the pendants was to literally show them the path to get there? Like, they don't even know they have to put the pendants in the eyes of the dragon. Dragon mural. The Ten Rings ambushed us in San Francisco. They took my pendant. They're gonna come for years next. I don't know what he wants of them. We both know it can't be good. Apparently, she told Wenwu how to use them, even though he's not welcome in Talo, but she didn't tell her kids who she gave the pendants to in the first place. What? Guess these outfits are one size fits all, because it's not like she knew when they were going to arrive or how big they were gonna grow. What if Shang-Chi came to Talo when he left the compounds at 14? What if he became extremely buff or really fat? I know you might find it annoying I'm lingering on this line, but it baffles me how something so simple like providing an outfit can be so nonsensical when you ignore the context to try to give it some deeper backstory. It would have made complete sense if the ant just said, here's some dragon scaled armor from our arsenal, try it on. Anyway, for the remainder of the day, Shang-Chi and Katie go their separate ways to train, the former in airbending and the latter in archery. My mother was the only one who could beat him. Show me how she did it. Sorry, champ, you're gonna have to be a hot young woman to do that, because Wenwu would have annihilated her if he didn't stop to watch her and was consistent with his rings. Shang-Chi has a little pensive moment to himself and reveals that when his dad sent him on his first mission to kill the guy who killed Ying Li, he went through with it. And now he's making it this big deal, telling Katie, oh, I'm not who you think I am, and making it sound like he's ashamed of her knowing he's killed before. He also thinks his mom would hate him for having done this, and now he's having this epiphany that he needs to kill Wenwu. All of this is weightless because A, he's had no rule against killing throughout this movie and participates in it, and B, he fucking forgot his mom willingly dated the man who's killed god knows how many hundreds of thousands. I doubt she'd care if her son punished the one responsible for her death. The next day, Wenwu and his men arrive. Wait, the next day? I thought he said, Three days from now, we will rescue my wife from her prison and bring her home. And it's implied Shang-Chi and the gang went through the forest the morning after that. Then they spent the day in Talo training. Then Wenwu arrives the following morning. So, two days. You couldn't even get that right. Wait a minute, I just realized something. Everyone in Talo already knows Ying Li is dead. They have a shrine for her. Kay? Who told them? Who told them Ying Li is dead? Good question! These people don't leave Talo unless it's to guard the entrance. So was it Wenwu? The guy who doesn't know how to get to Talo? Okay, maybe Ying Li used to visit Talo from time to time, and they inferred that she died when she stopped visiting for several years. In fact, that would partially explain how she was able to tell her sister to prepare the outfits. Maybe she visited after both of her children were born. But that means, for some inexplicable reason, Ying Li never took her own kids with her to meet their family. Okay. 
Keep in mind, Wenwu is the only one who's not welcome in Talu. The ant literally greets Shang-Chi and Jialing with open arms. You see, you're probably young. I'm going to assume you're younger than me. Probably by decades. So there's this thing called life experience. Burn it down. What? Just destroy them yourself. It'd certainly get the job done much faster. Or tell your men to run them over with your jeeps. Wenwu finds the shrine for Ying Li, who, according to him, is alive and trapped behind a wall as punishment. Shouldn't he be wondering why Talo has a memorial for a living person they're pissed at, and maybe perhaps realize they're telling the truth? It is of no concern. Wenwu and Shang-Chi fight, and for some unknown reason, Wenwu now blames him for not doing anything while his mother was attacked by the Iron Gang when he was seven years old and before Wenwu even taught him how to kill people. <laughs> Shang-Chi then says, Even if you could bring her back, what makes you think she'd want anything to do with you? Oi, dipshit. She was okay with him conquering and murdering for thousands of years. What exactly do you think she'd oppose now? Yep, he's dead. It's truly sad it needs to be said, but remember that everyone in this movie is a regular human with regular vulnerabilities. They fly now! They fly now! I will give this moment one thing though. I'm glad they had Wenwu briefly propel himself before landing to soften his fall, otherwise his legs would have been obliterated. <laughs> Okay, if the punch didn't kill him, it would have at least completely knocked the wind out of him. AKA, he 100% should have drowned by now. Wenwu somehow doesn't see or hear the soul-eating minions escaping through the wall. Same goes for the dragon that just burst out of the ground. Either that or he chooses to ignore it. I gotta say, the rules for the minions are about as fortified as the rules for the Dementors from The Flash. So you know they fucked up. It's established that the only material that can kill the minions is dragon scales, and they show normal weaponry phases right through them. But then somehow, Blade Arm Man can just grab one. He repeatedly tries to stab one, phases through it each time, but his hand doesn't upon grabbing it, preventing it from killing him. Okay. Also, the giant lion pooch thing can kill the minions by just biting them. Okay. Wenwu somehow isn't destroying Shang-Chi, who was taught airbending only a day ago. Uh, oh, it looked like he was about to clap his cheeks with that move, but they just cut away from it. Okay. I'm sorry, how fucking long are these ropes meant to fight other people around you? Not only is the dragon hundreds of feet in the air, but it's constantly moving, and she happens to nail the minions. Okay. This is a genuinely funny moment with Trevor, because it entirely stems from his character and isn't something random flung at us. We haven't seen him throughout the entire fight, and when we finally do, through Morris's perspective, he seems to be dead. But this dedicated actor, known for being a coward who doesn't want to die, has just been performing. Calm down, mate. I'm not dead, it's just a performance. Now get down here, play along. 
the Dweller in Darkness busts out from too many minions collecting souls and feeding them to it, and Wenwu finally realizes he was tricked, and thus begins his well-earned character arc. Nope, he pushes Shang-Chi out of the way, gives him the rings, and then dies. <laughs> this fucker was an irredeemable moronic asshole throughout the whole movie, and in his final moments, he terrorized Talo, broke out a soul-eating demon, and its minions they've contained for 4,000 years, when this really shouldn't have happened and then died. And I think the movie wants us to feel bad for him. Mission failed. We'll get him next time. I'd like to point out that none of the minions went after Shang-Chi or Wenwu despite being the closest people to them, but they're the main characters so we can't have that happen. I mean, neither of them are equipped with dragon-scaled weaponry, so imagine if they did go after them. Would kind of, sort of, maybe just a little bit change the plot. The rest is just green screen schlock whatever man, please be over soon. I think the three biggest offenders in this scene are the siblings being able to hold on to the dragon when it's basically a roller coaster, Zhelling's close range rope weapon literally turning into Wonder Woman's lasso. Like, seriously, you expect me to buy this amount of rope can extend this far and just wrap around stuff at will? And the unexplored abilities of the rings. Like, what are these things? Nando couldn't even answer in his video without making a really broad guess. They are so powerful, so versatile. Can anyone even tell what the stakes are when wearing them? One of them carries Shang-Chi at some point, providing yet another potential way when we could have traveled to the Talo entrance. I guess he never tried doing that in his 2,000 years of using them. Okay. Speaking of Nando, I know breaking down what Wenwu and Yingli actually did in this movie makes this video obsolete, but to restore balance, I want to bring up this other video of his. Now I consider this one to be clickbait, because it's more of a critique of Katie's character rather than praising her. At least, that's what I thought the title was implying. But Nando makes a good point. The movie tries to give Katie some kind of... Arc. It's set up in the beginning in this breakfast scene, where her mom says grandma didn't come to America for her to get a Berkeley degree only to park cars. Then at the bar, her friend tells her she should grow up and live up to her potential. Then her conflict is stated in the scene where Katie tells the elder that she admires the villagers for knowing exactly what they want and spending their lives perfecting it. Unlike her, where she gives up on something when she starts getting remotely good at it. But this isn't true at all. If anything, the once skill we know Katie has mastered, driving, is present throughout the movie. It's literally her job, one that isn't even a detriment to her life. Shang-Chi has the same job as she does with no support, and he manages to afford his own place. Katie isn't struggling financially from what we can tell, and she visibly enjoys being a valet attendant. But this plot line throws Katie under the bus for not working in an office. Movies love to use jobs like this as shorthand for a poor lifestyle choice, but it's a job. One Katie is good at, and one that gives Katie time to hone the skills that Katie uses to save the world. But in Talo, the movie gives up on that to tell us that Katie is actually a screw-up who needs to stick to something, and that something ends up being archery. Yeah, she's told if you never aim, you'll never hit. Then she trains in archery for a day and nails the neck of the Dweller in Darkness. Then she goes home. That's it. I have no idea what conclusion she's come to. Will she abandon the job that she enjoys to become an archer, or will she look for a job that uses her degree? Which isn't even a decent message to put out to begin with. And I'd agree with the whole wasted potential thing if Katie was a lazy bum refusing to put her skills to use, or if her current job was actively making her miserable, but she's afraid to leave it because it's a stable source of income. Fuck, that one sure hits home. Anyway, despite this plot and its characters being in shambles, there's a nice scene where everyone is honoring the fallen warriors. Shang-Chi! Do dad. you have the rings? Uh, yeah, yes. Good, let's go. We have a lot to talk about. You too. Ah, uh, come on, Wong. Fuck off. This movie is not even trying in the slightest to make Katie relevant or justify why she's brought along in three major plot-thickening moments. I don't match any artifacts from our codex. What do you think? They're not vibranium. Ch 
Did you guys fucking forget that after years of back and forth between Bruce and Hulk, you finally had him make the decision to spend 18 months in a gamma lab to create Professor Hulk as a compromise? Damn. Fuck off, fuck you. Why make Bruce's off-screen development seemingly definitive and meaningful to him if you're only going to completely backpedal on it? Apologize to Mark Ruffalo right now. You continue to do his character filthy. Fuck you, Madvocate. They probably didn't have the budget to spend on the Professor Hulk effects. Oh, yeah, you're probably right. And it's not like they could have cut out a different big CGI character that was completely pointless and created from scratch and used that money on him instead. Do you remember- Abomination. You gotta give it up for- Abomination. I do! I do remember- Abomination. Oh, oh boy, it's another article. I'm sure this'll clear things up. The rivalry between Bruce Banner and Hulk was fixed, and Bruce's human form was completely out of the picture. It turns out that this is likely why Marvel made the switch in Shang-Chi, as the studio always wanted to have Bruce Banner be an important part of Hulk's character, according to an excerpt from the story of Marvel Studios, the making of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Oh, they always want Bruce to be part of the character. Yeah, okay. It's not like there's a three-hour movie saying otherwise. Not sure why they don't consider Bruce to be part of Professor Hulk when he's verbatim the best of both worlds. It's like they completely missed their own point they made. Looks like they also gave up on Carol's girl boss haircut too. Guess she was a little too sensitive to Rocket Raccoon's remark. What, you gonna get another haircut? Is that like a personal attack or something? How about we mention the elephant in the room? This man, who's supposedly Bruce's friend, illegally trains the monster that almost killed Bruce years ago. What a good friend he is. What a good friend you are. And that's it. That's Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Strategic Genius. Get it? The Strategic Genius is a legend because there was no Strategic Genius? He was fake. I made him up for an inside joke title. Let me know in the comments if you thought I was actually about to praise Wenwu as a villain. A special thanks to Sky, who discussed new issues we found while I was writing this script, and for inviting me on her podcast to break down this mess and review videos praising it. After seeing this movie, I had no interest in making a video until we went through it on Ecom. so this video's existence is pretty much thanks to her. She also made a Shang-Chi video of her own. You can check it out on her channel, which is linked below, as well as those Shang-Chi streams. Thank you to these mad lads, my patrons over on Patreon. Your generosity is always immensely appreciated. And shout out to abuzz03, codename John, Dominic the Donkey, Drunk Dan, Galactic Archive, Karen Williams, So Who, Studio Devil, and The Spicy Gentleman for being the wealthiest men alive. Thank you to world-renowned e-girl Pooch for lending her beautiful voice to play Fala Chen. And thank you to world-renowned e-squirrel and Spider-Man Slayer Shandy Desquire for lending his voice to explain the Professor Hulk retcon. And thanks again to Surfshark for supporting the channel. Remember that a massive discount awaits you through the link down below.